Okay, so my name is Josh Boyer. I am uh, theoretically the team lead of the Fedora kernel team. That really just kind of means I'm the contact point and I shield people from various nasty comments as much as possible. Um, this is the traditional state of the Fedora kernel or Fedora kernel talk. Um, it is not about like super cool technologies in the kernel. I'm not gonna tell you how RCU works. Uh, if you would like to know, read LWN. Excellent articles on LWN. Today we are going to do a little bit of a release overview on how we operate the kernel in Fedora uh, in terms of rolling out new versions and things like that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the team. It's changed uh, over the last year or so. Uh, we're going to have some focus areas that we're currently either working on or looking to get into in terms of what our team is doing in the kernel to make Fedora better. And then we're going to talk about some future kernel developments that, that includes like Fedora 23 and some of the new shiny things that, that uh, showed up in the kernel over the past year. <coughs> so release overview. Um, we have one kernel, pretty much. That's really two. But we have one kernel for every release, right? So Fedora 22 is on 4.1.5 is in testing. Yes, thank you. Um, but right now 4.1.4, 4.1.5 is in testing, uh, so 4.1 is the major version. Fedora 21 is also on the same. Uh, Fedora 22, I already said that. Fedora 23 is on, we're in that weird branch state in Fedora where we just had alpha, uh, but it's on like the 4.2 RC candidate kernels. So what we do is we kind of rebase as the new upstream release comes out and we roll it back in a graduated fashion, right? So when 4.2 comes out, Fedora 23 will get it. Uh, Rawhide is continuously rebased every day. Um, Fedora 22 will get 4.2 probably around the 4.2.2-ish time frame, so a couple weeks after release. Uh, uh, and then Fedora 21 will be a week or two after that. And we do it that way so that the oldest, most stable release um, kind of isn't, you know, it's not broken <laughs> right away. And if there are major issues with the rebase, we tend to fix them before we roll out the next one. Um, we do it for a few different reasons. Primarily, we do it so that we stay close to upstream because the developers are either still working on it or actually, you know, they haven't heard that whole release out of their mind. Um, and we do it to consolidate bugs, basically. Pretty simple. Uh, this next slide here is um, it's an example of why I'm not a graphic designer. <laughs> But it's a really terrible, not updated flowchart from the first time I did this presentation uh, about how we do the rebases. And I'm not going to make you stare at it. I'm not going to read it to you. I'll post the slides uh, on the sketch description afterwards, and you can marvel at my terrible skills. So right now, like I said, um, we're on 4.2 for Rawhide and Fedora 23. I didn't add it on this slide. That must have meant I started my slides before Alpha came out. Wow, I'm impressed with myself. Um, Fedora 22 started with 4.0.4, and the way we pick the kernel for the release uh, is kind of, it's kind of throwing a dart and sticking it at the wall because it depends on the upstream kernel cycle, it depends on the Fedora cycle, and it depends on how willing QA is to let us squeeze stuff in at the last minute, or conversely, how willing we are to subject ourselves to the punishment that comes afterwards. Um, so as you can see, Fedora 20, which just went end of life, went from 3.11 all the way through the 4.0 kernel, uh, and it worked out pretty well. We had regressions as we go, and we get those, uh, but we try to fix them up as we go. So, any questions on how we handle the kernel in Fedora? It's pretty fast, but it's also the same way I've talked about for the past three years. Okay, good. Um, team stuff. So like I said, our team has changed right now. Laura Abbott is our newest hire. Hi, Laura. Uh, Justin Schwartz has been on the team almost as long as I have, right? Or are you, did you join at the same time? Uh, I think the team was over there, so I was doing Yeah, you were doing Burton stuff. stuff. Yeah. So Justin is uh, four, years. four years. I think so. He's been on the team since the first block, anyway. So at least three. <laughs> um, and then myself, and then we had various architects or contributors. Um, Peter Robinson, who is actually giving a talk on power and ARM right now in a different room, so if you're interested in ARM, that's probably where you want to be because I'm not going to talk about it, um, is 
one of the only other people who actually has a consistent amount of commits in our Fedora kernel. He handles all the cool 32-bit board stuff for us, and we love him because that means we don't have to worry about it. Um, we have Dan Horak, who does, he doesn't really do kernel stuff, but he handles S390, and he's more than happy to point out upstream patches or broken issues on S390. Um, and then we have a very large contingent of Red Hat engineers behind us. And when I say that, I don't mean that it's like RHEL, right? RHEL has a literal army of kernel engineers for various things. Um, but we do get to leverage them when we ask them nicely to look at certain bugs. And we try not to do it too often because they're pretty much buried all the time in upstream and RHEL work. But when we do approach them, they're very helpful to have. So what do we do all day on the team? Um, in the past, the next slide, the answer to this question has been about four or five slides of bug numbers, charts, graphs, showing all this other stuff. Um, so today, there are no bugs. We, we don't do bugs. They're all fixed. Um, so I'm not going to talk about bugs. Sorry to disappoint if you wanted to see updated graphs. Uh, I can point you at Bugzilla and the queries I use to generate them, and you can enjoy them all you want. There, <laughs> there are 702 open. Um, on, on any given day, there are around 700 bugs open across all the releases. Um, so no more bugs. We're not talking about bugs. Let's talk about retrace, right? Yeah, what's retrace? Everybody know what that is? Good. Anybody not know what retrace is? OK, retrace is. <laughs> It's me being clever and saying we're not going to talk about bugs, but really we're going to talk about bugs. Um, no, it's, um, it's this infrastructure. So in Fedora, there is an automated bug reporting tool, ABRT. So if you get a kernel crash and it's not one that locks your machine up, say your wireless driver craps out and you get a backtrace, it'll collect that and send it to um, the ABRT servers and the retrace servers. So it collects all these reports in an automated fashion and then it points out how many of each instance there are. And if you go look at the retrace server, it's kind of frightening. Because um, you'll see like one specific backtrace from a wireless driver will have like 30,000 hits, which means 30,000 machines or instances uh, has happened just for that one. And then if you look at all of them for the kernel combined, it, it's just as frightening as Bugzilla is. But we switched to it this year, or we're in the process of doing that, because Bugzilla is a mess. Bugzilla, there is humans involved, okay? So you get, you get the automated report, you get the backtrace, and you start poking at it, and you realize there isn't enough information to even start looking at it, and then you start asking people for more information. Sometimes they're really great. Uh, Justin just had a talk uh, last session about how to get your bugs fixed, um, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes people are like, you know, my wireless doesn't work, just fix this now. And you ask them for information, they don't, they don't, they don't want to be participating. So it's really, really hard to get a broad overview of which bugs are hitting the most number of people by looking at Bugzilla, because it's specific to an individual report. So Retrace offers a higher level data where we can look at it and say, okay, this i915 bug, you know, there's 30,000 machines hitting it, or this, this wireless driver, there's 40,000 machines hitting it, whatever the case may be. Um, and Laura has done some work since she joined us to help us cut down on um, bogus data and kind of help prioritize where we're going to look. So we use that now. The problem areas we see, um, I-915 right now, uh, so in the last three kernels, so 4.0, 4.1, and what will be 4.2, um, they're doing this work in the I-915 area, and it's really for all kernel mode setting drivers where they're doing atomic mode setting. So, you know, you change panels, you change resolutions, whatever. It's all going to be atomic now. In the past, it's kind of been this kludge between uh, X and the kernel and how it does it. Um, it. It's complicated, but it hasn't been atomic. So sometimes you get things that are out of sync with each other and then you get bugs and it's nasty. So as kind of a byproduct of that or a side effect, the i915 drivers kind of destabilized a little bit as they work this in. Um, because it really is a complex problem. So we're seeing a lot of issues there. We're doing our best. Uh, suspend resume 
is a traditional one that we always have problems with. Right now, they seem to be tied to the I-915 problem, uh, but they are also, you can have suspend resume problems for any number of reasons. A single driver not you know, failing to, to go into suspend is basically all it takes. Or you have bogus firmware. We really don't like those because you can't fix the firmware on the machines and people don't understand that sometimes. Um, wireless used to be like at the top of the list. As long as you're using the open source drivers, it's not that bad. Um, that being said, the Intel wireless driver does tend to freak out a little bit these days, but it, it, it ebbs and flows. Uh, and then platform drivers is a typical one. Um, so, you know, your function keys don't work. Like, in, in fact, this laptop here, I can hit the brightness keys with the function keys and it doesn't work at all. I think Owen actually has the same laptop with the same problem. I have a patch to fix it and I sent it and the i915 driver people were like, okay, that's good, but you need to do it like this way. And doing it that way requires rewriting like half of the ACPI I need 15 infrastructure, so I'm not gonna do that, sorry. <laughs> Fortunately, the little GNOME slider works just fine. Uh, and then Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth is usually an area where people suspend, they resume, and Bluetooth sets up this nice backtrace. Why? Depends on the, the chipset, depends on the firmware. So these are the problems we see, and we're using retrace to kind of help us prioritize. So. What do we mean by priorities? In terms of priorities, this is what we have here. We focus on the most severe ones, obviously, first, uh, and that kind of goes counter to the number of people being impacted, but we do that to prevent you know, CVEs from turning into major events. Um, high retrace count reports, like I said. Uh, corruption issues, fortunately in the kernel, <laughs> unless you're using ButterFS, we haven't really had any corruption issues that are major as of late. I think there might have been one EXP4 bug in the past year that I can think of. Um, yeah. And there might have been one XFS issue where you mounted the file system in a certain way that the metadata didn't match and something minor happened. Um, but, you know, corruption does happen. Uh, so we focus on those when they come in. And then general kernel crashes. Um, again, brightness, touchpad, they all kind of fall out after that. Sound is down towards the bottom of the list. Um, it should be higher, but we just don't have the time to get to it, right? It's really frustrating when people buy a machine and they plug in their headphones and they can't hear anything. I understand that. I would be frustrated as well. Um, we just don't have any expertise with the Alpha subsystem at this moment. Um, ButterFS is on our list, contrary to what everybody thinks. It's not that we hate it. It's just that we don't promote it by default. Um, but it is tied to basically reporting to upstream saying, we're seeing this, are you guys seeing this? And they're really responsive when we do that, but they see a lot of issues, so they're also a full block. And then down at the very, very bottom, after global warming on Mars, we have I-686. We don't, um, we don't focus on Intel I-686 bugs at all anymore. Uh, we sent out an email to the development list in February and said, hey, 32-bit Intel i686, if, if this is gonna survive, then the community needs to step up and do it. And everybody ignored us, basically. So it's just not a priority for our team. It's not that we don't, it's not that we don't have nostalgia for it, and it's not that we don't even have machines. I have a 32-bit machine at home, but if it had a, an issue where it wouldn't boot, I would go buy a cheap 64-bit machine instead of fixing it. That's where we are today. Um, if you really enjoy I-686, please find me afterwards and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Well, in, in your interesting data points there, the 32-bit came up and you were going to be out of where 32-bit was not used. Yeah. Yeah, it's not actually reported. Well, it's not actually reported. No, it's, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with people telling us that it's broken. I have no issues with that. I would love to know that information because then I can say, look, this is what needs to get fixed. And it, it turns out that that issue was in the kernel for two months and nobody nobody noticed. So right, right. Yeah. So it's just it's not something we focus on. It's not that we hate it. It's not that we want it to die. Um, 
we just don't have the cycles to spend on it, that's all. Uh, focus areas. So focus areas are, I mean, they're not a new concept, but it's something new that we're trying this year uh, because staring at retraces, staring at bugs, it, 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 we can do it, but it's enough to drive you crazy, right? There's always going to be bugs. We're not going to fix them all, unfortunately. So what are some of the things we're looking at? We're looking at power management. This one came from Christian, who conveniently left, um, but Matthias is still here. <laughs> um, so this one came up, not actually, it was fairly recently in, in terms of Fedora timeframes. Um, what can we do to have better power management? You know, suspend resume obviously is one of them. If it doesn't work, then your power management stinks because if you fold your laptop closed and stick it in your bag and it doesn't suspend, then when you get home, either it's overheated because it stayed in your bag and stayed on, or you know, hibernation failed, it doesn't matter. So that's something we're, we're not charging forward on, but it's something we're looking at right now. It's hard to figure out exactly what we want to do there. Um, more automation. So we have a number of different projects. We already have the kernel test harness and infrastructure so that as a build comes out of Koji, which is our build system, if you don't know what that is, um, Justin wrote this test harness and framework. It picks it up, it boots it, it run, runs a regression test, all in automated fashion, has results on the web, and it's actually very, very useful. Um, because before we had that, it was one person would build a kernel and we boot it on our local machine or few machines, and if it worked, everybody else gets it, right? So we're, we're improving our test coverage through automation. Uh, the exploded Git tree that we had, we started at the end of, after last block, I think. Um, so Fedora's kernel is packaged as a tr traditional RPM with like a tarball and patches applied to it and stuff like that. And all the kernel developers we would talk to would say, this is terrible. How do I recreate your kernel? Because you guys are carrying patches. Um, which is absolutely true, but we don't carry a whole lot of patches. I think we have on any given day in Rawhide somewhere between 50 and 80 patches, and most of them are very, very minor. Um, so I created a, an exploded Git tree that the developers were used to using. And that went fine until about a month and a half ago when we tried to switch to using that instead of like the traditional RPM setup as the canonical source. And it worked, but it was really, really cumbersome to take that and go back into a Fedora package that everybody actually consumes. So we're gonna, I'm going to step back and look at automating the creation of the exploded tree instead of vice versa. Uh, and then testing, I covered with Justin. Uh, he's actually testing Linux Next, if you don't know what Linux Next is. Does anybody not know what Linux Next is? Good, excellent. I see some confused looks, but it's basically what it sounds like. It's what will be the next version of Linux. Um, so he's testing that, which we've never done before. We aren't gonna ship it, because that would be a little too crazy. But, you know, testing it now means we find the bugs and we report them upstream while they're still developing them before they get into Linus Torvald's tree, which means you don't see them, which is excellent. Um, and so I have on here upstream, and it's kind of a, kind of a depressing goal uh, for a focus area in, in a number of ways, but our daily job is not developing kernel code. It's not even necessarily fixing kernel code at this point, but that's something we're trying to get to. Um, over the past year, I might have three commits in the upstream kernel, and for a kernel maintainer, that's, that's sad days. <laughs> I mean, you know, packaging is fun, and I'm glad I'm participating in Fedora and providing value, but it's not what we want to be doing. So we're trying to have like a getting back to roots, going back upstream, making sure we're actually making an impact there as well. So that's one of the focus areas. And then at the bottom I have our yearly plan. Uh, so I'm part of the, our, our whole team is part of the Fedora engineering team. It's run by Paul Freelds. Um, we try to be open and transparent what we're doing. We are some of the few people who are blessed to be working on Fedora. 100% of our time, that's what we get paid to do. And so kind of as a, you know, a thank you or, or a encouraging participation part of that, what do we do? We put it on the wiki, and there's our plan. So if you're interested in what we're looking at, beyond what I have on these slides, uh, you can certainly click on there. You can email us on the Fedora kernel list and ask questions, and we're more than happy to answer them and turn them over. Uh, Fedora 23 Outlook. All right, so Fedora 23 Alpha just came out. Yay! Um, I think it shipped with 4.2 RC5, right? With like one extra patch to fix the i386 bug, <laughs> of all things. 
We're probably going to wind up releasing that with the 4.2 kernel because the development time frame for 4.3, particularly now that we're getting into conference season for kernel developers, is probably going to lag a little bit and it'll just cut it too close to the end point. Um, so 4.2, it'll, it'll be like a 4.2 stable release. So, geez, by then it'll probably be like 4.2.6 maybe uh, if it lasts that long. So, but 4.3 is possible. Um, some other changes that happened. So, Fedora 22 came out with, was it Fedora 22 or Fedora 21 where we did kernel core and kernel modules? I think it was 22. 21? All right. So we don't tend to change the packaging of the kernel very much, uh, but in Fedora 21 we split into kernel core, which is like, it's not like a pure true core, but it's a much smaller package, basically usable for most VM machines. And then the rest of them are in kernel modules. Um, this time around, I was talking with uh, Harl Horrier and his team, and he said, why are we shipping stuff in slash boot? We should only be shipping in slash user slash lib, whatever. Um, and I said, well, Harold, you know, you have to have a kernel in slash boot so grubs can grab it and boot can't not ship and slash boot. So after about two weeks of trying to figure out what he was trying to do, really what he wanted was all the packages in the Fedora should only install in slash user, essentially, so that you can go in and do like the equivalent of a factory reset and all the other directories go back to whatever they were before you installed Fedora. Makes sense. So we worked out a way so that we ship the actual kernel part that is normally in slash boot in the RPM package itself. It's in user lib modules and then the kernel version string. Um, and then when we install the RPM, there's some script lists to go and copy it over to slash boot. So it's not that we're not installing a slash boot, it's just that we do it in a weird way so that you can do factory resets. Um, and he, his team finds that useful. Whether that'll boil out into something that you see in Fedora, I don't know, probably not. Um, somebody asked me today if we'd see it in containers, and you know, I'm a kernel guy, I was like, oh yeah, maybe, and then I realized you don't need a kernel in containers, so probably not, but I don't know, Harold and his team come up with some crazy stuff, so maybe you'll have, uh, you'll have some use out of that. Um, best case, you just don't even notice. Uh, minor tweaks, so just moving some modules around inside the, the content of kernel core and kernel modules, nothing really big, um, and since the question always comes up, we still do not recommend ButterFS as the default file system for your machine. Uh, every year we have the conversation in some form. I think we asked on the desktop list again this year, somebody did, about whether we want it for workstation. So I emailed Joseph. Uh, Joseph, how do you say his last name? You know? Anyway, Joseph is one of the main ButterFS developers. Uh, he used to work for Red Hat, he moved on to Fusion IO, which is like this Flash-based uh, data center type storage company, and then he's now at Facebook. Yeah. Um, so I emailed him and said, "Hey, this question's going to come up. You're the primary developer. What do you recommend?" And he said, "Not yet." And so what they're doing at Facebook is they're, is they're rolling it out kind of behind the scenes on their storage areas and trying to scale it to 40 terabytes um, across one file system which is awesome, and I've seen the commits go in for that. There's fixing a lot of corner cases still, some data corruption bugs uh, at scale, right? Um, so I emailed him, I said, Joseph, that's awesome, but nobody in Fedora is gonna have a 40 terabyte laptop. I'm sorry, but that just doesn't, it's not the same kind of workload that we see. So he said they are doing other things that will produce similar <coughs> workloads to what you would normally do on a laptop, but they're not there yet. Once they do it in Facebook at scale, uh, they'll shake out all the bugs, and then it'll be maybe time. So another six months, which has typically been the answer <laughs> every release uh, for the past three or four releases. Um, Do you know what they think about it? Like, are they thinking about like, really pulling off with that? Yeah. Like, yeah, Joseph pointed out that SUSE, um, so in OpenSUSE, it's just the ButterFS driver, just like it is in Fedora. And I think they have defaulted to it now. Or it was just with their yeah, latest version. Well, in SLES, what they did is they turned off all the fancy stuff. So there's no like transparent compression, you can't do RAID. It's basically snapshots and that's it. And they only ship it on 
the root partition basically, right? So um, user data is still on like EAT4 or XFS or something, I don't know. Uh, but we can't do that in Fedora because we've already shipped the driver for however long it's been out there since Fedora 15 or 16. Um, and if we turn off those features, then people who are using them will be broken. So we can't kind of cheat and get there before it's ready. And the OpenSUSE guys have worked on it for a while. They're definitely fixing things. They, I mean, I see posts from, you know, at SUSE.com quite often for fixing bugs. So I'm sure they're running into issues and finding them, which is excellent, because usually it's the other way around, right? Fedora tends to be the distro that finds all the bugs and then gets them fixed upstream just because they're so bleeding edge. Um, but yeah, it's, he just said it's not ready yet. Um, whether it will be ready around Fedora 24 is a wait and see. Uh, but you know, unless you're really kind of hankering for snapshots or some of the other high level features that are awesome about it, it's really kind of a, like why, why do you need it? Right? Well, and, and how does Fedora relate to the other snapshots? Right. Yeah, I mean, if you want snapshots and rollbacks, you can do it with device mapper, you can do it with um, sin provisioning and things like that. Uh, it's not as integrated into the OS as we would like, um, or simple from a command line standpoint to do, but I'm, I've been told by Stephen Gallagher that they are working on it with a project called Storage Key and things like that. I mean, the, the problem is that the other side is not really, not really integrated, like all the features right. not really integrated to the desktop either, right? Partly because there's a small lag, like yes. you're told not to use it, so Right, yep, absolutely. Um, and I, I totally see the value in integrating it so that you can do transparent rollbacks and make it really simple. And you know, if you want to do like time slider stuff, that'd be cool. Um, it's just every time I ask the person that works on it for his job, he tells me it's not ready. So I'm not going to be like, yes, let's ship it. Uh, it's just, it's not ready. Um, but there are some other shiny things that have landed in the kernel. Uh, overlay FS. So for the longest time, What's it called? AUFS was the kind of like the out of out of tree uh, union filing system that everybody carried. Fedora even carried it at one point a long time ago for their uh, it was either their live image. I think their live image was used it long, long time ago. Um, and then sorry, what? Docker. Yes, Docker. Docker uh, has a backend layer that uses OverlayFS now. Didn't Alex do that? Alex Larson? Yeah, Alex Larson um, kind of wrote that. And it, it works. Uh, it was merged in 4.0. There's, there's bugs here and there, but it's it's kind of the only you and uh, you know, it's the only upstream union filing system that we have. So uh, Alex from Butter yep. Yep. yep, yep. Butter switched what it does on the back end from uh, ButterFS snapshots and things like that to overlayFS to use that instead. It does now. Didn't they fix it in, didn't they fix overlay FS and XFS? They did. Yeah. I believe so. There were other things, um, so XFS and Docker itself didn't get along because of namespaces. User namespaces did not work with XFS, but that's also been fixed. Uh, as of like 3.19? Yeah. So XFS should work. If it doesn't work, I would, uh, I would humbly be surprised and I'll go look at that because it should. Um, KD bus. Leonard likes to talk about KD bus a lot. So if you've seen any presentation he's given in the past year or so, it's been about KD bus for the most part. Um, Essentially all it is is an in-kernel IPC mechanism that kind of replaces user space dbus. And it's kind of contentious. Uh, they posted it for inclusion in 4.1 and it was immediately shot down. Lots of upstream kernel developers were not very happy with how it was posted and how it was um, kind of positioned for inclusion. So they took 4.2 off. They said, okay, we're gonna go work on some of the feedback we got. We're not gonna post it for inclusion in 4.2. Maybe they'll try again in 4.3. Um, Harold again asked me, what can we do to get KD bus into Fedora in a way that it's actually useful? Uh, we used to have, or we still do, uh, have a repository called Kernel Playground where we kind of pulled in 
things that weren't quite ready upstream or things that were maybe in staging that, that we weren't willing to enable with prop Fedora proper, and we pulled KDBus in there. And it worked, you could install it, but it wasn't getting the test coverage that they kind of needed. Um, so what we did is we made this deal where we pull in KDBus into the Rawhide kernel and Rawhide kernel only. So if you go and you boot Fedora 23 Alpha, KDBus is not in there because we said we're not gonna ship something in a release branch before it's merged upstream. So it's only Rawhide. Fortunately, you can use Rawhide kernels on Fedora 23 just fine. So if you wanna play with it, just install the Rawhide kernel. And then boot with KDBus equals one on the command line, kernel command line. Uh, probably wanna set SD Linux as permissive if you're gonna do anything other than just boot. If you actually wanna log in, probably need to do that. SD Linux is being worked on. Um, it needs kernel level support for how KDBus works and it isn't there yet, but they are working on it. Um, is it something that absolutely has to happen? No, but when KDBus is merged, it will enable a lot of different things that you can't do today just because of the way, <laughs> if you have your init process start and it's not also your main system bus and you start your system bus later, lots of weird stuff happens when you restart the bus. So by shoving it into the kernel, you can just enable a lot more things. Uh, and then live patching. So Major and I were just talking about this before the talk started. Live patching is uh, commonly known as K-Splice, which is a, it's an Oracle product at the moment. It's basically exactly what it sounds like. You compile this little tiny piece of code and you can fix a bug without having to reboot. Um, Fedora does not enable it. And it's simply because the amount of time and energy to produce those tiny little patches when we rebase the kernel as frequently as we do, is not worth it. Uh, it is enabled in that kernel playground repository, so if you wanna play with it, you can enable it, or you can go use it and then build your own k-patch patches, um, but we don't, I mean, we just don't ship it. So for things like RHEL, which has a really long life cycle, you know, short, you know, long time between updates, it makes a lot more sense. Um, whether or not RHEL is gonna actually use k-patch and live patching, I don't know. Uh, I don't get paid on RHEL stuff, so they might. It makes sense there, but it doesn't make well. So that's pretty much the, the highlights list. Um, I'm trying to think if there was one more that I was just thinking about or not. I can't think of it at the moment, so. Questions? Anybody? This talk goes much better when people ask me hard questions, or any questions. Yeah, um, so like I said, it was posted for 4.1 and it was shot down immediately. There have been patches that have come in since then to address a lot of the feedback. Um, there's a guy by the name of Andy Ludomirsky, Ludomarsky, Ludomirsky, um, that does a lot of like low level x86 stuff, but he also is really interested in like security aspects of things. Uh, oh, that's what it was. Oh, okay, I'll answer your question and then go back. Um, so he's been reviewing the code pretty heavily and he, keeps coming up with ways to boot a machine with KDBus, run a simple client, and bring lots of destruction to the machine. Um, when you take your, your message buffers and you move them from user space memory to kernel space memory, it's a lot easier to starve things, apparently. Um, so it turns out that there's some bugs that he's still finding. Whether or not it gets merged before three, we'll see. Um, the way that it was kind of positioned was, this is kind of like, Binder, if you know what Binder is, it's like an Android IPC system. Uh, the way Greg Cohartman pulled Binder in is he basically said, look, there is a massive number of users for this piece of code. It doesn't impact anything outside of itself, so we're gonna pull it in. And it had some objections to it. There was some high profile kernel developers that did not wanna see Binder get merged. Uh, but Linus can actually be pretty pragmatic at times. So he said, fine, if Greg's gonna maintain it and he's willing to spend the effort to do that, that's kind of how KDBus was positioned. Uh, it just, it didn't work when they tried that 4.1. So um, the 4.3 development window will open probably in about a month, and then we'll see what happens then. I'm kind of optimistic that something similar will happen because they are kind of taking the feedback that Andy and others have provided, but I don't know. I'm, I mean, if anybody knew, it would be, Greg and Linus, and I don't, I mean, 
they're pretty transparent. I don't think they're you know, privately emailing to get it in. So we'll see what happens. Um, any other questions before I go back to what I was thinking of? Um, That's an excellent question. Will real-time kernel patches ever be available? In Fedora? No. Probably not. Um, there was a discussion a couple months ago on one of the development lists, or uh, development IRC channels, about somebody who wanted to provide a real-time kernel. And they asked me what they could do to get it in, and I just said, no, sorry. Um, again, it's, it's a cycle thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're having enough trouble making sure everybody's machines work without real-time aspects to them. I don't want to provide a real-time kernel and have people expect that this robot arm that's moving is not going to crush somebody's skull. <laughs> so um, that being said, after a lengthy discussion, uh, I, I said if you want to have a real-time kernel in Fedora and you want to provide it in a Copert, which is, um, so if you know what, yeah. So I said you're more than welcome to do that. It's fine. I don't care, just as long as it doesn't conflict with the actual kernel proper. Uh, it's not that we're not interested in real-time necessarily. It's that it's a very hard problem to solve. Um, Red Hat has paid one of our engineers, uh, we have a whole real-time team, we have a real-time product. Um, we've paid the kernel engineers you know, for quite a while now to get those patches worked on and upstream, and they still aren't there. So it's not only a hard problem just in terms of cycles of support, but it's a hard problem just getting the patches upstream, because some of them, um, you know, they've made very, very good progress, and now that the, the patches they have left, are the really, really kind of nitty gritty hard ones. <laughs> and so we're just not willing to carry that in Fedora. It's just the number of users we would get is very small versus the amount of effort we would have to spend rebasing patches, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not like you can add the patches and have one kernel provide real time and not real time. It doesn't work that way. So um, it's a good question. I hope somebody does eventually build that coper. I don't think it's been done yet. Yeah, that, uh, they've always had a real-time kernel that's kind of been based on Fedora's, I think. Um, and I don't, maybe it's successful, maybe it's not, I don't know. But uh, I know it's big in the audio, uh, audio projects and stuff like that. Anybody want to rant at me for not fixing a bug that they filed? <laughs> That's it. All right. Well, thank you for coming.